Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew White. I am. Uh, I work here at Park Pride, and it's my honor to introduce today's um, session, um, The Green Tipping Point. Green space is a catalyst for community preservation and prosperity. Um, I did want to give just a couple. Most of most people have been using um, the chat and the other features of Hopin uh, with great success today, but I'm going to go ahead and go through a brief technical orientation. Uh, for those who may be just joining us or um, for those who, um, uh, there are actually a couple of features now um, that are um, a little different than the main stage. So this is what your screen should look like or something similar to it. Um, if you double click on any of our pictures, it will replace um, the, the it, you can enlarge um, any one of the speakers at any time or the presentation. So if you want to take a closer look um, at me or <laughs> or um, look what books are in Nataki's background, you could do that. Um, or you could also just keep the presentation, uh, you know, big as well. And uh, to minimize, you just double click the large again and, and it returns to normal size. You can also, um, if you're having trouble reading any of the slides, you can make the slides bigger by um, by clicking that little arrow up here in the corner. And if you do that, it makes the screen, it expands the um, visual part of the screen so that you can see more of the slides, more of the speakers, and less of the chat. Um, and I know some people find chat distracting too, so you, that's one way you can, um, if, you, if you're not a chatter, not a chatty person, you can just um, minimize that area. Um, if you do want to use the chat, we just make sure that this blue bar is below the word session. Um, if you if the blue bar is below the word event, then that means that the chats that you're reading and the chats that you're sending are going out event wide. So if you want to target your chats to the folks just in this session, um, then that's the uh, that's how you do it. Um, which we hope you will. Um, you can also use other, um, you can use um, the Q&A. So uh, again, blue bar below session, um, you can ask a question um, by clicking this blue button down here at the bottom and it will appear in the queue here. Um, you can also like a question that has already been asked. So if somebody has already put something up there that you're like, yeah, that sounds good. You can like it and um, we'll be taking a look at those um, during the discussion. This is going to be a very interactive session. So um, there's actually going to be ample opportunity to ask questions and participate. So speaking of that, after um, our speakers have given an, um, their introductory remarks, um, there will be a time when you, the members of the audience, will be invited to share your screens um, and be and appear on the screen along with everybody else. Um, so when you're invited to do so, there's a you should see a blue button up at the top of the screen that says share audio and video. Um, and so when you're invited to do that, you can click on that. And then a little screen, you know, looks probably something like this will pop up and you'll see yourself and you'll be able to select your microphone and your camera and then you'll hit apply. And most people can probably just use their default settings for this, um, especially if you're using Zoom on a regular basis. This is probably all. Um, well, you're all well um, oriented, but this one's this this part is a little bit different, a little tricky. So we actually have a maximum number of nine people who can join the screen at any given time. So um, because I see there are 51 people in this session, um, which means you know you guys are really um, wanting to um, talk about this topic. Um, just make sure that when you're done participating, when you're done um, saying what you have to say, uh, just click the leave button. And that doesn't mean you leave the session. It just means that you're going to leave the screen and, and that your camera is going to get turned off. And it, what that's going to do is make room for somebody else who's behind you and who's waiting for their turn to speak. So make sure to be considerate of your fellow um, audience members. And when you're done speaking, just click leave. Um, and then, of course, uh, when we're done, you can use the buttons on the left-hand side of the screen to navigate um, throughout the throughout the rest of the um, uh, conference, um, including the stage, which is where our final keynote um, presenter will be. Uh, Atia Wells will be um, speaking at um, 2:15. Yes, 2:15. 
So if you have a question or need any help, please ask in the chat box. I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing my screen here and um, introduce our wonderful speakers. How do I do that? Okay, great, that worked. So um, Cicely Garrett is a creative strategist and social entrepreneur who is adept at providing thought leadership and consulting services in areas such as design thinking, racial equity, environmental justice, food sovereignty, grants management, and community wealth building. Cicely spearheaded the transition of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to the Office of Resilience under the 100 Resilient Cities program pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. She also served as a community builder, facilitator, and program manager for eight and a half years at the Atlanta Community Food Bank, working to improve fresh and healthy food access in Atlanta's inner city neighborhoods. A lifelong volunteer and servant leader, Cicely was awarded with the Outstanding Atlanta Community Service Award in 2014 and Creative Loafing's Neighborhood MVP in 2015. Cicely holds a BS BA degree with a concentration in finance and new small business management from Georgetown University and a Master of Public Policy with a concentration in nonprofit management from the George Washington University. Um, Thank you, Cicely, for being here with us. Uh, Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks is an assistant professor at Spelman College, the manager for community and leadership development programs for the National Wildlife Federation, and chair of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. That, that is an organization committed to ensuring environmental justice in Southwest and Northwest Atlanta's African American neighborhoods. An environmental engineer by training, Osborne Jelks is committed to being a social change engineer. In addition to her role at National Wildlife Foundation, Osborne Jelks is a senior fellow with the Environmental Leadership Program and is the co-founder of the Center for Environmental Public Awareness, a public interest nonprofit consulting organization that develops environmental education and leadership development training for community groups. Um, as an alumna of Spelman College, Osborne Jokes studied civil and environmental engineering at Georgia Tech through a dual degree program and earned her Master of Public Health and Environmental and Occupational Health from Emory University. Um, thank you, Nataki, for being here. <laughs> uh, Ms. Ola Reynolds is chair of the Neighborhood Planning Unit G and that is the neighborhood planning unit that represents 14 neighborhoods and has been active in MPUG since, two, since um, 1995. This, she is an advocate for community development, education attainment, sustainability of affordable housing for all, and all other aspects pertaining to components that will make our neighborhoods and communities safe and livable. Her passion is also for seniors, youths, and much, much more. So thank you, Ms. Reynolds, for being here. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cicely to get us grounded, and I will see you at the end of the session. Andrew, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Green Tipping Point session. Um, we hope today we'll start off with providing some foundational information for you. Um, and then we want to open this up to a discussion and invite you into the discussion. Um, some will be allowed on screen. Um, you can also post in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and we'll try to um, weave those into the conversation today. Um, but first, I want to provide a little background about how this session came to be. Um, so I will be your moderator for today, as he mentioned. Um, uh-oh. Hold on sharing the wrong screen. Um, so as he mentioned, um, we are all here, Nataki and I are part of an organization called the Regional Center for Expertise. And so there is a listserv where we like to share information and talking points um, about just what's going on, articles that we see. And so um, the Regional Center for Expertise um, as you read in the write-up for this, um, is a network um, 
of a collaborative of uh, universities um, from across here in the metro Atlanta area, but it was started by the United Nations um, as an affiliated regional sustainability network that supports multi-stack, multi-stakeholder implementation of the United UN Sustainable Development Goals through education and training. Um, we are one of the few um, regional centers for expertise um, that also includes HBCUs in our network. And so there was this listserv that we have and Nataki had written this wonderful article, which I'm gonna let her talk about next. Um, and she shared it out on the listserv um, talking about um, the effects of uh, green gentrification in communities. And so it sparked a fairly robust conversation, which later led to us having um, a moderated discussion where um, I interviewed her and, and people spoke up. Um, but it led us to the question about what is it that we could do um, as a regional center for expertise, as well as other multi-stakeholder groups to better support communities um, who are faced with some of the effects of green gentrification. How can we not only help them mitigate um, and um, uh, rectify some of these uh, issues, but how can we also help them be more preventative um, and not come in and supersede the community or replace um, their our judgment for theirs, but how can we really be supportive um, and take this back to their communities? Um, and so with that, we'll have a local example to share with you today from Ms. Reynolds um, with Westside Parks to couch our conversation, but we really want this to be a bigger conversation about and for you to share about what is it we could do um, better as a group to help support local parks. Um, that are in communities facing green gentrification. Um, so if you wanna find out more about RCE, the address is there on the screen. Um, you'll learn some more and there'll be some people dropping links in the chat box in which to engage you um, as well as following this conversation. Um, so I am going to now hand it over to Nataki who will give you some information about um, her part in all of this. Thank you so much, Cicely, and thank you really everybody for being here today um, to talk about what I think is a very important topic. Um, to give you just a little bit of background about how I sort of find myself in this space, um, you know, as was read in my bio, um, I am uh, involved with the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, otherwise known as WAWA. Um, I also teach at Spelman College in the Environmental and Health Sciences program. And so kind of wearing uh, a, few, a few of my hats, if you will, um, kind of teacher and researcher, as well as, you know, community member. Um, I live in West Atlanta. I recently moved to Southwest Atlanta, but for over 20 years, um, I lived in the Proctor Creek watershed and I lived in Northwest Atlanta. Um, so I have um, spent, you know, a lot of time working on um, issues around watershed restoration, as well as um, parks and green space and green infrastructure um, in the last several years. And so out of that work, um, you know, I, I really began to be concerned um, about new parks and green spaces and the potential for them to um, displace, you know, long-term residents, you know, of, of our city and in particular on the west side and in the Proctor Creek watershed. So um, as, as a person who likes to um, marry my interest, um, you know, so as, as a researcher um, and teacher, I like to teach about and conduct research on the things that I like to do, you know, um, in my community, um, the work that I do to advocate for my community to make it greener, cleaner, healthier, and more sustainable. So I try to marry those interests quite a bit. And um, a, a few years ago, I um, was invited by Dr. Venice Jennings um, to write an article um, that was focused on um, parks and green space and the pursuit of health equity in different parts of the United States. And so we looked at a number of different case studies, including some here in Atlanta um, around the Proctor Creek watershed. And one of the things that we talked about in this article was that there are all these positive benefits associated with a connection to green space. Um, and we can see, you know, that access to and connections to green space as one vehicle to help us to get to health equity, this idea that everybody has the opportunity to live th their, their best lives, um, you know, from a health perspective. Um, but what we, you know, brought up in this article, this first article that was a commentary, is that those benefits won't necessarily be realized if people are not able to stay in place um, where these new parks and green spaces come or where even, you know, older parks and green spaces are, are revitalized. You know, what, what, um, 
you know, access itself is not is not enough. We have to make sure that there are supports, that there are policy measures in place um, to make sure that the people in many cases whom we say those parks and green spaces are for really get a chance to um, to, to, to reap the benefits, you know, of these new investments. Um, so from that piece, um, we wrote kind of a, that was sort of an academic piece. Um, and then we wrote a, more of a lay piece that was in um, Parks and Recreation Magazine, which is the official publication of the of NRPA, the National Recreation and Park Association. And so this diagram that you see uh, up above is from, is from that article. I know you can't see it very well, but it sort of talks about, um, you know, sort of these ways that we can try to um, help achieve health equity. And so you see things like access to material resources, you know, enhance social environments, increase political power, quality natural and built environments, which include, you know, access to quality green spaces and parks, walkable communities, those types of things. So that's what you see kind of in the column on the left hand side. And they kind of all flow into this one box that talks about, um, you know, the the equal distribution um, across socioeconomic boundaries um, so that everybody can benefit from these from these you know benefits um, and this idea that we have to look at programming um, as well as systemic remedies to overcome byproducts you know of these processes like gentrification and in particular drink green gentrification if we want to make sure that we are creating these conditions that support health equity so to, to make sort of a long story short, you know, after this lay piece um, that we wrote in the Parks and Recreation magazine, you know, I started thinking I wanted to um, help to produce or generate something um, in the literature that would help us to support um, the the calls that, you know, um, that we were making and hearing on the ground as we think about things in our city, um, like the Beltline, um, as we think about, you know, things like Cook Park and Westside Park, and if, as we look to, you know, what has happened in places like um, the historic Fourth Ward Park, you know, what do we have in the literature, I was asking, um, to help support community claims um, for for policies that will support people being able to stay in place to really get to that health equity that we say that we're working to achieve. And so as we began to look in the literature, we didn't find a lot there. So um, I had the idea to um, write what we call a scoping review, which is a review of literature that's already been published. And I thought that this might be a good starting place. So I um, asked um, Dr. Venice Jennings to join me, um, and another colleague, um, Dr. Um, Alessandro Rigolone from the University of Utah, um, who has done um, amazing work on green gentrification. And so um, I think I have like maybe two minutes left. Let me say a couple of things that we found in our article, but let me just kind of um, preface this by saying that what we found was not rocket science. This is the stuff that, you know, we definitely felt like we already knew um, from what we see and experience in places like Atlanta, you know, from my lived experience working on many of the projects, um, many, you know, part parks and green space projects, you know, being tuned into things like the West Side Park and going to um, the public meetings that have been had, you know, before uh, the pandemic sort of stopped, you know, some of that. Um, and so, you know, I was still having some of these same questions, you know, how can we use every possible tool um, to combat green gentrification and the negative impact um, that it has on uh, communities of color, low income communities, and uh, long term residents um, of communities. And so, just kind of briefly, uh, just to highlight a couple of things that we learned from um, from this article and our review of the literature. Um, we looked at about 15 studies. There were about 15 studies that met our criteria um, in terms of having some sort of um, studies that were looking at some sort of impact on health um, where there was green gentrification taking place or in communities that were already gentrifying um, for which there was also some addition of new parks and green spaces or trails or something like that. Um, so we found um, in the study, and I have a few bullets here uh -oh, that I just lost, um, but essentially, um, you know, what we found um, was that, you know, long-term residents, mar what we called um, in this article, marginalized residents, which were a combination of um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, low-income residents, long, longer-term residents, um, all of these residents um, suffered the most in terms of, um, 
you know, green gentrification related projects or projects that spurred on green gentrification. Um, so that was something that was that was really important. And again, not something that we um, didn't already know. Um, we looked at the fact that or what we found in these studies that black people and older individuals tend to have the worst health impacts from gentrific gentrification um, when compared to whites and younger people, um, specifically as we relate to things like um, health outcomes, um, physical health outcomes in particular. Um, several studies that we reviewed um, showed that when you have um, these groups that have historically been marginalized in gentrifying neighborhoods, um, that in many cases, they reported no positive impacts, well, and we're talking about self-reported health here, from being close to a park or green space. Um, but people of higher socioeconomic status um, or white people reported um, more protective effects or helpful effects of living close to those parks and green spaces. Part of what we found, and there's some nuances here, um, is that you know when people feel like they are not um, welcomed in those green spaces, um, in gentrifying neighborhoods, when they feel like what has been developed is not for them, um, and their sense of, sense sense of and connection to place is impacted, um, then they may may sort of you know kind of push back and not use those those green spaces. Anecdotally, um, I, I feel like I've seen that. Um, I had students with me from Spelman College sort of studying this um, on the West Side Trail um, before the pandemic. And now the pandemic has kind of changed everything. But before the pandemic, we would do these observational studies where we looked at what was happening on the East Side um, Beltline Trail and what was happening on the West Side. And it was a stark difference in terms of the number of people that you saw using um, using the Beltline segments, um, particularly as we talk about people who lived in those neighborhoods. And just, again, anecdotal conversations, not, you know, we haven't done, you know, um, kind of solid research on this yet. But in these anecdotal conversations, you know, you heard people saying that they had resentment about how some of the project, you know, kind of came to be. Um, I'll never forget, you know, being at the opening of the West Side Beltline Trail, um, near um, the Kroger um, at um, Cascade and Ralph D. Abernathy. And, you know, as the ribbon was being cut, there were people there protesting, saying, you know, stop the belt lining, invest in black communities. And so while I don't think that they weren't saying, uh, weren't saying that, you know, putting the belt line here is not an investment, but, you know, it, it kind of brings to the uh, brings this issue to the point, you know, were people um, not only engaged at the table, and I know that, you know, maybe the Beltline is, uh, well, it's still a good example, you know, there are lots of study groups and lots of things that we can point to about the ways that people have been engaged, but being engaged, you know, in some of those discussions is, is, is one thing and making sure that there are policy supports in place to make sure that people are not displaced from their communities um, and that they actually get a chance to um, benefit from these green spaces, parks and trails is, is a whole nother issue. And so I know I'm kind of going over time here. Let me just point out a couple, a, a couple of um, other bullets from our study um, that I think are, are really important. We looked at issues around safety concerns. Um, and so on one hand, um, in terms of safety, we found instances in studies um, where white people were stigmatizing black indigenous and other people of color in some circumstances in terms of uh, not feeling safe, you know, in the parks. Black indigenous um, and people of color communities. On the other hand, um, some black indigenous and other people of color were also saying that they experienced a lower sense of safety in green spaces where again they were in these were green spaces in their communities but they were not feeling welcomed you know into those spaces because of the gentrification um, because of this feeling that these these amenities um, were not created for us but they were created for those who are moving into our communities um, so I'll kind of end there um, by just saying that um, you know for, you know, we only looked at about 15 studies that kind of met our criteria for this article um, or for this study, um, but consistently we saw um, that marginalized um, residents perceived their sense of community to be lower after green gentrification occurred um, and that they had a lower sense of well, of, of belonging to their own neighborhoods and green spaces. Um, 
which they perceived often to be serving the wealthier white newcomers. Um, so when we talk about all of these things, um, we have to, to realize, it's, it's if we think about what Kofi um, Boone said earlier about Dr. M uh, Mindy Fullerlove's piece on root shock, um, this is what some communities are experiencing. And so I look forward to getting into some specific conversations about um, the West Side Park and then um, talking about what we can all do to help address some of these issues. Thank you. For that, Nataki. Um, now we will turn it over to Ms. Reynolds from the West Side Park. Ms. Reynolds, would you like to offer a few comments? Yes, thank you so much, Cicely, and thank you, Dr. Jels. What an awful offer article you have written. I'm sure people will enjoy reading this. But first of all, I just want to thank Dr. Jels for inviting me to have something to say. As it was said earlier, um, I am a, I am from um, the Monroe Heights community, and I'm honored to be here today. And my name is Ola Reynolds, chairperson for NPUG for over 14 years, and I do live in Atlanta, in Northwest Atlanta, in the Monroe Heights community. And I am an advocate for community development, education and much, much more. But as Dr. Jeffs was talking, uh, gentrification is an ongoing challenge for many cities worldwide, in which this includes the city of Atlanta, whether it's new development or green space like the West, West Side Park. And it's often described as a process or progress by which uh, un reserved neighborhoods that develop and affluent newcomers become homeowners. So what happened to the long-term residents that has been, you know, near the West Side Park? And this is my concern because we have lived in this area for, for years. And no, we do not want to be pushed out and I think this comes with communication. I've been with the West Side uh, Equitable Development Task Force for over 12 months, and the working groups within the task force is working diligently with the city of Atlanta to mitigate what will happen to the long-term resident near the park. Communication is the key. Whatever is done, within the city of Atlanta or elsewhere, there should be communication. Because we as senior citizens, we still want to enjoy what's coming to our neighborhood. You know, I'm excited about, you know, the West Side Park, but I don't want to see long-term residents be pushed aside. So that's where we have in the, in the uh, task force group, housing because we know uh, gentrification and, and gentrification is inedible. It's going to happen. But work with the residents surrounding the West Side Park. We're concerned about the transportation. Uh, we know where the park is. There is going to, you know, resident lives near the park. So are they going to be able to get home if they leave? Will they be able to get into the driveway or whether other, you know, people visiting the park will have blocked their space or the driveway and can't get in? And transportation is important for the long-term residents that live near the West Side Park. So that is one thing that we're working on. Uh, whether there's going to be spaces rented elsewhere where the long-term residents will not have to be worried about that. Also, quality of life. We all want to have a quality of life where we live and we just don't want to be pushed out. And I'd just like to share that it's, you know, this is old saying you have a new broom and you have an old broom. The new broom 
can get more dirt faster if you're sweeping. But some of the young people may not know, you know, use broom, vacuum cleaners, what have you. But with me growing up, we have brooms. I still have a broom. But a broom that has been used, it can get in corners where the new broom cannot. So what I am saying, I'm using that analogy. The young can do things maybe quicker and faster, but those of us that have long lived long enough and have the wisdom by certain things, we can share that with you. So we do not want to be pushed pushed aside. We want to be involved. We want to talk to and not act. We just want, you know, the younger ones to communicate with us because we do have something to offer. That's why I'm still being active as I am within the communities that I serve. And it's just an honor to be involved. And not only me, there are others, uh, other my peers that want to be involved. So com continue to communicate with us about the West Side Park or any other development that is coming to our communities because here again, we are here and we do not want to be pushed aside. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Olive. Um, let's all give her a round of applause <laughs> for that. Um, I am going to stop sharing screen now. Um, and now becomes the participation part of the conversation. Um, we would like for you, if you would like to join us on the panel, um, we have room for up to five, six more people to join us. Um, so I dropped a question in the, in the chat box. And so our first question up for discussion is, um, as you think about this, is how can multi-stakeholder groups like the RCE Network and others support Ms. Reynolds and other groups and other community-led efforts um, in, in their quest to counteract gentrification. So how can multi-stakeholder stake, multi -stakeholder groups like RCE Network and others support community-led efforts to counteract, gener to counteract gentrification? How can we help Ms. Reynolds and others age in place um, and also benefit from the changes that are coming um, and not be seen as um, parks and other green spaces being built for someone else? So if you'd like to join the conversation, please um, enable, I think um, Ellen has dropped some instructions in the chat box um, about how you can share audio and video and you can join us here and provide your comments um, to the audience if you'd like to join us on the panel. Um, we can accept up to six people. Welcome, Dorothy, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for this um really enlightening discussion. Um, I wanted to say to Ms. Reynolds, um, I'm an old person. I'm 76. I've lived in my neighborhood, which is in Northeast Atlanta for 47 years. And I know what it feels like when people don't want to pay attention to you, want to talk at you, not with you. So um, I think it, it's, it's really important that we all have conversations like this. If we're all going to be stakeholders and we want to stay where we are for as long as we can, and you know, health issues aside, uh, then we have to figure out how that can happen. And I don't think it can happen if we're not talking to each other. So perhaps um, a group like RCE, which I admit I had never heard of until today, I'm, my apologies, um, but perhaps if we actually had some conversations, whether they're on Zoom or eventually in person where we can sit down and share our experiences and come up with some ways to say, no, I belong here, I'm staying, and how, how can we do that, um, I guess effectively by working with the city, working with our NPUs. Um, I try, I try to talk to my neighbors, but I know sometimes they think I'm a, you know, just an old lady. Um, and I have really strong ideas about sharing the space I have with everyone I can in terms of trails and parks 
Um, I live in essentially, not completely, but particularly um, a white area of town. Um, and I and I know that. Uh, but I also know that I want to be a better person, more inclusive. Uh, I feel like I'm a decent person who wants to not just go along to get along. I want to, if I have to, raise some hell. Um, and I'm willing to do that. I've done it almost all my life. So I don't know if that's any kind of an answer. Uh, I, I belong to an organization called the South Fork Conservancy, which is uh, building and maintaining trails along the South Fork of Peachtree Creek. And it go, runs from, say, Lindbergh down through Morningside. The, the creek does. The trails don't yet. But um, that's, what, that's what I'm working on as a neighborhood person and um, trying to care for each other, the neighbors. Pay, I, I go to the MPU meetings and pay attention to what people are saying and, and listen. And... Um, I understand that. I just don't know everything. I don't know a lot to do about everything, but I, I'm grateful for being here. I'm grateful for your conversation. And I'm very much looking forward to, to reading uh, Dr. Jelk's article and learning more about uh, the center. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, while we're waiting for someone else to join us and also um, add on to Dorothy's comments, there was a... Um, a comment in the chat box um, from David Lloyd for Nataki. Um, and he wanted to know, how do you think communities of color can overcome the impacts of green space displacement? And what changes can city government make to help sustain these communities? Um, and then we'll let James join in the conversation. So much for that um, question, David. Um, I, I think there, are, are multiple things that need to happen, but um, at the core of it, um, we've got to look at the ways that policy can be enacted to address some of these things. And when we talk about policy, I think we have to we have to get way ahead of these park projects. So when when the park is announced, when the new trail is announced, when a new segment of the Beltline is announced, the speculation starts. Right. And so we cannot try to deal with this after the fact. We can't build it first and then figure out, well, how do we keep people in place? That has to be a goal and objective from the very beginning. And so as we are developing parks, we need to be we had to we have to have our our you know housing strategy, whatever those strategies are around economic development, housing, whatever they need to be for that particular context, they have to go. I would even say ahead of the park, um, but definitely no later than right alongside it. Um, so I think in terms of, of government, we've got to be a lot more proactive. We've got to bust out of our silos. And I know that, you know, folks say, oh, we, we, we do, we talk, you know, with different departments. Um, but it, sometimes it just seems like a, a little, you know, too little, too late. Um, and so we've got to make sure that we, we do that silo busting and that, you know, th there cannot be a park, a new park you know, created in a vacuum, you know, where are the housing policy people, you know, from the very beginning, you know, or before we, you know, announce publicly that we're talking about this new park. Um, so I think that is just critical. Um, the timing of, of, of things is, is everything. I think there are also a couple of um, things that people are doing in other cities, like, you know, around the parks, um, you know, for instance, you know, sometimes that that land is, you know, the first right of refusal goes to kind of nonprofit, you know, affordable housing developers, um, even to government entities to develop those properties so that you don't have this um, instance of, you know, kind of private developers coming in, grabbing the land um, and, you know, contributing to, you know, the prices of housing, you know, sort of skyrocketing. So we got to look at those creative strategies as well. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to welcome to the conversation both James and Jonah. James, please offer up your comment. All right. Uh, greetings to the panel. I, I really have uh, uh, enjoyed everything that's been said. Uh, I live on the west side and have uh, been a big supporter of uh, the green space infrastructure, but there have been times when I have wondered if I'm running myself out of a home. 
And so uh, my question to you is, uh, and, and Nataki has uh, uh, expanded on a little bit of that. In your research, is there any city or are there any uh, policies that have successfully dealt with gentrification? And uh, green space uh, gentrification is just one aspect of gentrification, but gentrification is a thing. And how do we, is there somebody who's doing it that is a model? I know that the um, the um, 11th Street Bridge project in DC right now is being you know put up as an example. And there's an article. Did we already put the link? There was a link that I think we were going to put. Um, there was I'll a it. okay. There was an article that just came out really I think in the last couple of weeks to talk about that effort um, and how they are beginning to be sort of a, a national example about how to you know try to reconnect communities um, to parks and green space to try to keep them in place. Um, also, there has been some work done out of Los Angeles um, where you know obviously they're dealing with a a lot of challenges around the kind of revitalization of the LA River. Um, but there is a coalition called La Rosa. Um, and don't ask me what La Rosa stands for right now. I, I can't get it off the top of my head, but they have this approach that's kind of parks, like a parks and housing approach. They've even written, you know, kind of a guide about how you do housing development in concert. Um, with park new park developments, you know, with um, a stated goal of um, providing a house housing affordability and keeping people in place and not allowing the development of new parks and green spaces to be a driver um, of, of gentrification um, and displacement, you know, for for people in those neighborhoods. Um, so those are two places: um, the 11th Street um, Bridge Project in DC, as well as um, the work uh, out of La Rosa. Um, in LA are two two places that I would point to. And then I believe it's Oakland where they've been looking at, um, you know, the, the example that I mentioned earlier of making sure that um, private developers don't get that first right of refusal to the land around these parks and green spaces. So if you put it into the hands of uh, kind of nonprofit developers and others who are, you know, focused on things like affordable housing, then um, that keeps, you know, the, the speculation from driving things out of control. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonah, you have a comment for us. Yes, thank you guys. Um, the question is uh, kind of on the tail end. Uh, I understand the importance of working before these parks become reality to combat gentrification. Um, once once a park is a reality, for those of us who work for park departments, like myself, um, are there things that um, you wish would happen uh, in terms of the management of parks, the programming at parks, the staffing at parks, things like that once parks are open to the public that can help um, make everyone feel welcome and uh, combat uh, green vacation in the, the physical space of the park itself. Do so you wanna respond to that at all? It was a lot of noise, John, and so I didn't hear exactly what, all that you said because it was a little noise in the background. So the latter part, could you just re-ask your question again, please? Of course, I'm sorry. Can you hear me okay now? I can. It's just people okay. that is on phone is not muted, you know. It's all, anyway. all good, yeah. I'll repeat. Thank you. Um, I work for a Parks and Recreation Department and I'm wondering if there's ways, once a park is open to the public, that the, how, if there are ways that the park could be managed, programming could be produced, uh, maintenance could be done, um, and staff could kind of be in the park that would help make the park feel welcoming to all and combat uh, the feeling of being an outsider in your own park. Well, here again, as I stated earlier, it's about communication. And, you know, if, if the park is going to be maintained by the city or is it going to be maintained by the individual? Because I don't think individuals that is around the park can maintain it. But if there's communication 
And all of this should be done beforehand. Who is going to maintain the park? Uh, where the funds are coming because as we know to maintain a park it has to be funds in place to to pay whomever will be maintaining the park right so all of this should be done prior it's like don't put the cart before the horse if you ever heard that analogy you have your strategy already in place how this is going to be done and this is the concern that we have with the west side park how is it going to be maintained who is maintaining you know and so here again is communication whether there's policy in place all of this need to be done prior and this means inclusion of everyone if you're working on something years is the community is involved while you working on it oh but can i say something when y'all get a chance but when, when you have completed your work then you come to the community and you're like saying this is what we're going to do but was the community part of those plans so that's the main thing with anything strategizing and involvement about who who's going to do what and how it's going to be done i hope that answered your question thank you um so, so i am going to um shuffle a couple of people out who've answered questions before and um, we've brought in um, mother moore um as well as um michael halicki um i also want to throw out there um for everyone that i've also posted a second question in the box. um i posted a second question in the box um that you can feel free to respond to that one or the first one but our second question if you'd like to join in the discussion is what are some equity centered community led systemic changes that should be adopted to prevent the negative effects of green gentrification in the future um and so we've heard miss reynolds um I'm gonna mute you for a minute, Ms. Moore. Um, um, we've heard Ms. Reynolds and others talk about how early in the process, basically from the very beginning when it's just even a thought, the community needs to be um, both uh, bought in and be leading and invested in that process and should not be an afterthought of coming to present to you what we think you should be excited about and you know what good is gonna come to your community. Um, but what else beyond making sure that the community in which um, this will happen is involved from the very, very beginning of the process and much earlier than we have had a history of doing. But what are some other interventions that people feel like should be adopted in order to prevent this from happening in the future? And now I am going to turn the floor over to Mother Moore uh, for her to present some comments. Go ahead, Mother Moore. Yes, yeah, Cicely, am I in a position to be able to comment on the policy question? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, and I regret this, but in Atlanta is an anti-gentrification plan. The West Side Land Use Framework Plan, which was developed and adopted by City Council in December of 2017, and the zoning was adopted for it in February of 2020, is a plan that was developed and received a national award because of its anti-gentrification tenants. Uh, that doesn't guarantee, but it has put us as residents in a position to be able to fight for the maintenance of residents and the development that would allow us to be able to grow healthy and sustainable. And so I wanted to be able to say that there is an example of us as residents who participated Sister Ola, in the creation of that plan. The big fight for us is our people wanting to have everything look pretty real fast. And so they don't want to follow the zoning because it takes time. And that speaks to what do you do after you have a policy, Nataki? What do you do when you have a policy and residents are so eager to have things changed that they don't want to take the time to do what's there? There's also in that plan for English Avenue an eco district that is dealing with the parks. We have the first 
dual purpose park in Atlanta, I think in Georgia, the English, the Lindsay Street Park, which is now being managed by a green team that is set up by residents and is providing jobs at $15 an hour, five people team that is laying the groundwork for how do parks become an economic engine and not just a a tool that moves people out but doesn't provide benefits as well as community development. So I wanted to share with you all that right here under y'all's nose is an English Avenue West Side example of what's going on. And I think that the thing that you all mentioned earlier, we need to be talking to each other and sharing how do we do this? How do we help each other get these plans in place rather than just trying to go it on our own? So um, I'd like to see Park Pride continue to push for us to share those kinds of policy advocacy and that dynamics. Thank, Thank you, you, Mother Moore. It's always so good to hear from you. I wish I could hug you in person. Um, but Mother Moore is uplifting. Um, why should we be out here recreating the will? We have a West Side land use framework that could be uplifted and applied in other neighborhoods. Um, and it also brings up the point about if we're not, if we're going to have policy in place, if we're not ever going to put it into practice and use it, then, you know, that's that's just like not even having one. So how can we also better leverage these things that people have come to meetings, they put their time and energy into, and then these documents just sit by the wayside. Miss Reynolds and her neighborhood, they also have a very in-depth um, and very detailed document that they presented and have yet to see movement on um, from the municipality and other entities um, about some very straightforward things that could happen. And so how is it that we can make sure that these documents um, actually come to fruition and live and come to life beyond the words? Um, that are in them. Um, Michael, do you have a comment? I, I just wanted to add on to uh, something that, that Mother Moore had said in talking about the example of the ambassadors that we have, and this is through the Conservation Fund and their support to the JPB Foundation has been providing some support to allow for additional stewardship capacity. And um, I think that's something that's moving in the right direction in terms of figuring out elements of getting the community involved in being part of the solution um, so not just is there a maintenance plan, but how do you involve the community as part of that? And going back to the creation of those parks, Green Youth uh, played a role in hiring youth from the neighborhood, which again was uh, not a perfect success, but it was something where learning as we go down that path, I think we, we've been putting building blocks together. One thing that I wanted to mention that on the question about what is the checklist of um, and I think the first thing that was brought up of um, starting early in the process and involving the community at the table, I completely agree with. I do want to bring up that in the concept of green gentrification, one piece that oftentimes is missed is that scale matters. And looking at the smaller parks that have been done over on the west side with Lindsay Street, Catherine Johnson, Maddie Freeland, the scale of those projects are not as disruptive to the neighborhood economics. They've also provided opportunities for Workforce development, they're not as large kinds of projects that have barriers to entry. And they've allowed different ways so that art and other elements are part of the whole factor. And I think that looking at both the creation of smaller parks and under park parts of town, as well as the investment in existing parks, that sometimes we have this um, kind of fixation on the new. And I, I know that uh, Council Member Overstreet brings up Adams Park that was built at the same time as Chastain has the same bones, has not seen the same level of investment. And if we could actually lift up um, uh, that park um, as a destination park um, and look at the kinds of things that we have at Chastain, in some respects, I think that would be a better lift and it would be more supportive of the existing residents than another park of that same size and scale. So that's, that's really just, I think, expanding our thinking as we look at where do we have these fights I think smaller uh, parks, as well as leveraging those existing parks that need greater investment are places that I'd love to see uh, be part of the equation. And that doesn't take away from uh, the issues that Ms. Ola Reynolds had brought up with Westside Park and the enormity of that issue. But I think it's part of a, a, a mix of different types of solutions. 
Thank you for those comments. Um, I think it does go back um, to Ms. Reynolds' original comments about, you know, having an old and a new broom. Um, all of our investments and things should not just be put in making new um, and just abandon if there are some, um, some underinvestment um, that has gone on in parks for years and there are other communities that have parks but aren't get, reaching their full potential. Um, and as we come into our final moments, I want to invite any final people to join. We have a few minutes, um, but there was one question in the box um, that we did not get to um, that I want to uplift um, and people can continue to drop your comments in the box. Um, Dr. Jenny has also dropped a link. Um, so this is just the beginning of a conversation that we would like to continue with some actual fruitful things that come from it and action items. Um, and so if you want to continue with us and learn about um, other upcoming events that we'll pick up where we leave off here, please add your name to the link um, list that's been dropped in the box by Dr. Jenny. Um, but the other thing that was uplifted by Stacey um, Hagwood was how can municipalities work to increase investment in parks um, and green transportation in traditional black communities that are gentrifying without the backlash of um, people assuming that they're only investing for wealthy or whiter people who are moving in. Um, and so I'll open that up to my panelists and anyone else who wants to join to sort of answer that question. Um, I think the way that municipalities can get around this is A, by having some safeguards in place before you introduce this funding, including already having the communities involved so that they see that it actually is for them and not, not for them. They're not on the menu and it's not being done to them. Um, I think is one of the ways you could do that. The backlash would go away if the community saw the intention and then the follow through and the actions that went along with what was happening. And also seeing that the municipality was going out of its way to ensure that investors and others um, were not overrunning a community and there were safeguards in place to prevent that from happening. I think as long as you continue to have the investments being made without thought um, or input of the community and other um, safeguards in place to prevent, um, some of the large scale displacement um, and investment, you will continue to have that perception, whether intended or not, um, as an unintended consequence, if we aren't more intentional upfront about our actions and, and what they might end up with and, and some of the mitigating factors that come along with it. But I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Jelks or um, Olo, you wanna add anything to that in your final comments. Trying to let you go first, Ms. Reynolds. All right. Well, I could say because I see Andrew's here to to uh, give us the the hook. Um, ditto to everything that Cicely just said. The uh, other thing that I might mention is as um, government or whoever it is 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 working with community. Um, assume a posture of, of place keeping. A lot of times we get into this place making, we wanna recreate, we wanna do something new. And to really emphasize um, what Michael was saying um, about investing in what, what's already there, um, to keep that in place, to fortify it, to strengthen it, um, and to listen to the wants, needs, um, desires of the community to be a part of that change process. I mean, what you will find is that community can help diagnose its own problems. It can tell you what, you know, communities can tell you what they need and they can be a part of that solutions process. And so if that, if there is a real um, sense of collaboration and, um, you know, uh, partnerships that are equitable in which the community is at the table, then I think that is part um, of the equation for success. Great, thank you guys so much for um, this really incredible session. I thought the um, conversation was really great. Um, thank you for bringing people on screen with you to share their thoughts and the chat has been popping. Thank you guys so much for the um, comments in the chat and for the questions and for everybody's comments. But um, the time has come. Our time um, together has uh, come to an end today, but, um, but um, not for the conference, uh, our final keynote you can find um, on the stage will begin in 15 minutes. Um, Atia Wells is the executive director of Backyard Base Camp in um, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, a registered nurse and um, uh, fantastic community leader. I'm just gonna share some stories with us. So um, we hope you join us for that as well. Um, this is the last call to um, donate 
for um, the REI um, glamping trip. I think there's a, uh, in the chat there, there's no minimum donation. So whatever you can give, that's that's um, that will enter you in for a chance to win a glamping pr package from REI. And uh, with that, just again, like incredible gratitude and um, respect to our speakers and to everyone in our audience. Um, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Reynolds sends her best as well. She lost her internet connection, but thank you everyone for joining us. It was a pleasure.